Hello everyone and welcome back to Hypersonic Liner Design in Realism Overhaul in Kerbal Space Program 1.2.2 and in this episode we're going to radically change our main body design and see if that works out better for us because it will reduce drag. So this was the original Peregrine system, uh, sort of very familiar, we've put different engines, we've done different wing designs, but this was the basic idea and yeah, we're going to completely change it and use instead the Mark 1 crew cabin, which also has a crew capacity of 4, but is thinner. Now, actually, the Mark 1 crew cabin, weirdly enough, originally had a mass greater than the Mark 2 crew cabin, even that, though that doesn't seem to make too much sense when you... I mean, it, it, I don't know, it depends on how you look at it, but I set them to be both the same, so you might have to do that as well if you would like to uh, fix that. I mean, in particular, it really doesn't make any sense because the max volume of this, it, ha it can carry other stuff. And it obviously is a larger fuselage. But anyway, uh, if you feel that it should be heavier, that's that's up to you. And of course, we're going to be using the Concorde cockpit, but we couldn't use the Concorde cockpit I had before because that one is big. It's 3.1 meters across. So I created a new part, the mini Concorde cockpit. And that one fits the Mark 1 crew cabin. And it's about 2.1 meters across, which should still be enough space for a pilot and co-pilot to sit side by side in the front. So uh, that's the basic idea. Let's take a look at the design I cooked up. Okay, so right now this is the Concordina A. And I might want to change that name to something a little bit more original. But yeah, you get the basic idea. We again have uh, 16 passengers. The, the core mass uh, is mostly the same, uh, but I have lost one engine. I have decided to only use a single SR-71 engine because we had a lot of acceleration early on from the SR-71 engines, right? We could basically go at a very high angle, and it seemed like they could easily push us beyond Mark IV, so we didn't really need two of them. So that was a critical uh, reduction in mass. And uh, you can see we're about four tons uh, lighter uh, dry mass than the other design, which is excellent. And that's partly because of the engine and partly because of the wing design. I'm not sold on the wing design just yet, but uh, we'll work on that. Oh, and it's also because uh, fuel tank-wise, I think we've got a little bit less tankage. So there's that too. Um, let me give you the center lift center mass. Now people uh, suggested that I should just add more fuel to the other design and that would give us our range and it could be that we that that was the best way to go and then maybe we would need two of the SR-71 engines to carry extra fuel. Um, I tried also having only one ramjet that did not work so but I feel like the first thing you should do when you're designing something is first make it trim and uh, see if you can get better results with a trimmer design before just slapping on more fuel because more fuel means more cost per passenger and that's not what we're going for. So this is how the design is right now. Oh, let me show you. Um, that is where the center of mass is at the end. So that's why it's sort of, you know, where the wing is, is it's there because we want to sort of keep the center of mass not changing too much. And of course, in front of the center of lift, we could like change the wing design to uh, we could have moved the entire wing further back and then not have these going backwards, but instead make it more of a mm, tapered shape. But I gather that people aren't going to be thrilled by that. And this is somewhat more streamlined, though uh, the canards aren't exactly perfect in that. The nose of this is quite severe compared to the Mark II cockpit. So I might change the canard design a little bit. We'll see. But yeah. Uh, this is our new idea. It's possible that it would work with a ramjet. If we could put like a ramjet and one of these SR-71 engines like in tandem, uh, one on top of the other, right right there, maybe it'd work out. But yeah, that's that's a thought for later. Oh, uh, I guess we could have the SR-71 engine, the J-58, be like uh, an engine up here like on a DC-10. We could have that engine up there and then the ramjet down here. That's another possibility. 
Yeah, so I'm thinking about all these alternate designs, you know, a different wing, a different arrangement to the engines. But let's uh, take a look at how this goes and see what kind of range it has. Uh, but I still feel like uh, we have a bit of a problem with the ramjets that we're not going to get the efficiency we need. So this is only 20% utilization. The wing is 84. We don't really have fuel out here. And we don't really have fuel back here. And that's because that would move the center of mass back. We have these conformal tanks again. And that's moving the center of mass forward. And we... Actually, those are tucked in a little bit more than I originally had. I originally had the wing further back. And that's why they're placed there. But it shouldn't matter too much. Alright. So let's take it outside. Okay, so here we are. This looks like... A lot more like the kind of supersonic mini liners that they are attempting to design these days, so that's good. Anyway, uh, we've got our autopilot module manager and ignition. So we'll see how we get along with a single SR-71 engine. That's a huge weight savings, by the way. The engine is 2.7 tons, so getting by with just one is a big deal. Oh, uh, that was just a hop. It's not supposed to rotate just yet. Actually, these uh, gaps in the runway might cause... Oh, okay. I, I was afraid of that. Uh, it, it is not fast enough for it to fly. Uh-oh, uh-oh. No. Uh, uh -oh. Okay, well, all right. Let's try and salvage the situation. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, oh, no. So yes, for those wondering how, okay, I should use the other runway. I actually have, I actually have uh, Kerbal constructs and real launch sites in here. Uh, let's go back to space plane hangar and see about using the other one runway for the first time. I haven't ever used the other runway that comes with real launch sites, but and that's because I keep forgetting about it. But maybe it's time. So Kerbal constructs. Um, Is there no, I mean, it says Launch Complex 5, Launch Complex 6, and, um, run, oh, Runways. Well, it doesn't show the other runway, though. I know there's another runway there. Well, I think, once again, I've got a little bit of a problem with, uh, with relaunch sites. I couldn't even get it working at all in 1.1.3. Well, I'm going to make one little change for the sake of runway stability because our previous design, the Peregrine, had larger landing gear, just physically larger, and I think maybe that'll give us better luck. And I'll also see if I can tweak those out a little bit further from the body. Alright, here we go again. Okay, rotate. Oh, bounce. Uh, okay, finally off the ground here. Good times. Um, once we get enough height, you'll see the other runway that I was trying to start off at. And all these other launch pads that apparently I can't access for some reason. But you can see the other runway right there. That's the space shuttle landing strip, but apparently we can't use it for some reason. Don't ask me why, but it's right there. I've got something misconfigured. Anyway, as you can see, our uh, climb angle, if you will, from the horizon is about 23 degrees here. And we are somewhat accelerating, but not nearly as vigorous as we were with the dual SR-71 engines. It's worth uh, discussing the relative mass of this and perhaps the benefit of scaling up because right now we've got a dry mass of 18 tons, right? And we're carrying 16 passengers. At a uh, high density, 
you know, with the seats really packed in, the Concorde could carry 128 passengers, and it was 77 tons dry mass. So its dry mass is maybe a six and a half. I don't know. Um, about four and a half times this, uh, 18 tons versus 77 tons. Let's say, let's say four and a half times. But its passenger capacity is much higher. It's eight times. So yeah, if we scale up, there is benefits to that. I might be overdoing it with the vertical stabilizer. We could make that smaller potentially. It's always nice to have yaw control though. And you know, there are planes with larger vertical stabilizers. This is not not the most extreme I've seen, but there are also planes with negligible vertical stabilizers. So it's We'll have to see, but that is another mass after all. This is actually a remarkably efficient intake as far as things go. Uh, you'll note uh, intake area of 0.8. Uh, these are only 0.9, so that's pretty good. I don't know if advanced jet engines gives this sort of a different like efficiency at lower and higher velocities. I would hope so but I'm not sure. Right now on the single engine our estimated range is quite excellent but we're not going very fast. We're not going past Mach 1 yet. Let's see how that uh, changes as we increase our velocity. You can see it's already going down quite a lot but we, we are going up so let's level out and break the speed of sound and see what happens. We could probably do better if we could get rid of these engine pods and maybe make sort of the an inline arrangement over here. And then we could just have a wing without these engine pods at all. But that would only work if... I mean, I guess we could tuck like two ramjets at the bottom here. It's a bit complicated, but it's manageable. And if we could get less drag because of that, that would be a good idea. Now, I still haven't figured out why the game reads this specific impulse as 4000 flat. It could be that Advanced Jet Engines is calculating it properly anyway and that that's just lying. But I, I bet it does track. In other words, there's a relationship between the fuel consumption, thrust, and specific impulse and I think it's not lying about that specific impulse right now. So why Advanced Jet Engines isn't overwriting the specific impulse of this engine, I don't know. And it seems like the the configuration in advanced jet engines is proper but is something else interfering with it it could I mean there are a lot of things that interfere with uh, the model of this engine like vent stock revamp and stuff like that but they shouldn't interfere with the actual engine stats and of course realism overhaul interferes with engine stats but it's supposed to be you know dependent on advanced jet engines anyway and obviously compatible with it so I'm not sure. Okay, we can definitely level out here. And we're at Mach 3, so it's a good time to go to the ramjets. And let's get the numbers on that. And we've got to turn off the jet engine. So now the SR-71 engines is powered down, because I figure at Mach 4 it definitely should be. So we're not going to push it. Having this out we can compare it to the Peregrine I think at different velocities and altitudes. We should have a recording of that. I will actually throttle down to keep it uh, at Mach 5.5. On another test it seems like the engines exploded at Mach 6.5 but that seems to depend on altitude. We do have the engine temperature warning down there. Okay, well, we're not accelerating as much as I would like, so let's flatten out a bit first. Okay, past Mach 5. There's also a question of how far we can glide with this design. Uh, if, like, 
we ran out of fuel with uh, us going at the full Mach 5.5, what happens, kind of thing. It would be nice if we could just have one ramjet, and because eventually these are gonna push us to dangerous speeds, and I'm gonna have to throttle down here. But one ramjet does not seem to be able to accelerate us so that we can switch off the SR-71 engine at the right time. I don't know, it said 3,800 earlier. It's not giving us that kind of bang for a buck right now. We'll keep an eye on our downrange distance here. Right now it's summing up to about 4,000 kilometers total. But it appeared that we were getting better range at a different level. So that's sort of curious. I could probably pull back on the throttle a little bit. Again, I don't want to go too fast for this structure. But also, if we throttle down too much, we're going to face a situation where we suddenly start losing our velocity. And of course, with ramjets, that sort of cascades. And if you lose velocity, you lose thrust, you lose velocity, you lose thrust, and it gets to be a feedback loop. So that's not good. Right now, though, we can uh, double this number, 120, and just make sure it's beating drag. I wonder if this estimated range uh, takes into account the benefit of us losing mass over the, over the flight. I would assume so. As we go along, we're going to have to throttle down, assuming everything is working right, because we're getting lighter and we don't want to go faster. But as it is, you can see that this wing plan requires us to have an angle of attack of 6 degrees here. So it's not great. The use of canards is primarily so that we can get off the ground. The, these control surfaces are so close to the center of mass that they're not as effective, especially since we've got a weird runway. And right now I don't have any other option. Uh, this gives us a little bit more pitch control. It's possible that uh, to make these outer wing pieces just go like that, you know, uh, follow this edge as well as that edge, but then they'll be a lot smaller. And also we lose the ability to potentially fill this pod with more fuel and also fill them with more fuel because then the center of lift goes forward. And if you fill this with fuel, then the center of mass goes back. As long as we have these wing pieces like this, we can uh, we can fill this potentially with more fuel without moving the wing a whole lot. And even moving the wing back isn't going to necessarily solve the problem of the center of mass if we put more fuel in here because that fuel will go along with the wing. So that's why we need these like that out here. I'm not touching our throttle right now and so we're sort of drifting up a little bit because we're getting lighter. Interestingly, our Mach number seems to be either steady or going down even as our velocity goes up, so it could be that we're getting into a region where the atmosphere is a little bit thicker. That does happen. I don't know how RSS has it or where it has it, but the stratosphere does get a little bit more dense. And perhaps one thing we can do is optimize our flight to make sure that we go at a level where we'll get the best performance and you know the density can be helpful too right it's giving more air for the engines so we'll have to take a look at that right now it's looking about uh, 4,000 kilometers is what we're going to get and then we'll see how far we can glide after the fuel's done at least the ramjets seem to have the prop their proper specific impulse and it properly varies it's not like the SR-71 engines. Initially I thought that with the lighter body we could get away with maybe like F-15 engines and that would have been nice because they're like 0.9 tons a piece less than the SR-71 engines uh, but I had to have two. They, did, they didn't really accelerate us to the point where I could use the ramjet though but I was only using one ramjet on that test so maybe with two of those and two ramjets it worked better but that would be a heavier arrangement than this anyway. So this is probably better. But it depends if we can figure out 
how to get the proper specific impulse for the SS anyone engines, then maybe it's going to be less efficient. It's probably going to be less efficient than it is right now at the flat 4000 ISP rate. What would really be nice is a proper combo jet engine and ramjet engine, which should be doable. I mean, of course the SS-71 engine is sort of like that, but we can't trust it above Mach 4. Really, we can't trust it above Mach 3.7 or something like that. But yeah, if we could have like a pro- uh oh. Hmm, we have overheating of the crew cabin. Well, that, that is something that we were, we were trying to test. Frankly, this is not a very good system for a transatlantic flight. You, you generally need to have at least two engines for that to be certified, and I don't know if two ramjets would count. Right now we only have one jet engine that can operate at lower altitude and velocities, so a failure of that would be pretty bad. So, yeah, I don't know if this will uh, satisfy regulators to have just one engine of the normal air breathing low altitude sort. I have not made any uh, new configurations for engines just yet so we're just using the normal J58 and ramjet given a little problem with the J58 that we know about. But yeah, another option that is coming down the road is just creating a new engine. And, but to do that I, uh, what I'd want is a jet engine, a co combination jet ramjet that can operate past Mach 5, as opposed to SS anyone, which is a combination jet ramjet that can operate up to Mach 3.7. Whether I can get that and what realistic stats I can get for that, that's a tricky business. Whether I can get that to operate on uh, something other than liquid hydrogen or some cryogenic fuel is another thing. Right now it is kerosene, which is good because it's dense and the tanks are light. If you want cryogenic fuels, that's special handling, right? The airports have to have special handling equipment for all that, and the tanks are heavier. On the bright side, of course, they can facilitate cooling of the engines. That's the whole point of them, really. So we can have them cool the engines properly and get more efficiency like that. And, of course, uh, the cryogenic fuels are inherently more efficient because the exhaust is lighter. I mean nobody wants on a hypersonic transatlantic flight to have to go to like Greenland or Iceland first and then go to or uh, go to Newfoundland first and then cross. That sort of defeats the purpose. I really think that we might get better efficiency at lower levels, I'm not sure. You guys can feel free to inform me about that. Actually, you know what? It would be possible to save some fuel for the SR-71 engine to complete the flight and see how far, far we get with that as well. Right now I'm just gonna burn these uh, ramjets out. We'll just have them go as far as they can go. But another option is to cover the center portion of the flight with the ramjet engines, but then switch to the more efficient jet engine uh, for the remainder of the flight. And that could, and you know, obviously we'd have to decelerate to Mach 3 ish before lighting it, but that could be a viable option. Well, it seems like Mach 5.55 is okay for this cabin right now, even though it's really pushing it. I did not change the temperatures on the Mach 1 crew cabins, I don't think. Uh, one of the problems with trying to like give you guys the craft files of these things is um, I actually don't often remember exactly what tweaks I do. I know I haven't tweaked the uh, ramjets uh, except obviously updating to the most recent advanced jet engines to fix that other problem but I haven't uh, touched either of these engines that much I know. But there are little things like these conformal fuel tanks I made. Those are those are parts I made in Blender. They're not great and one reason I don't share them is that there's a weird symmetry problem with them. You can't put them on in symmetry, so this one has to be put on separate from that one. And then you have to sort of tweak them to make sure they're in the same place. 
complicated stuff like that. And of course, like here, I resized that cabin. Uh, well, I had a new part, so I actually added a new part in the realism overall configuration for stock extensions to add that crew cabin. And I forget if I added tweak scale to that tail connector, or I think that that j it just yeah, it comes with tweak scale. In this case, I'm not using my uh, special lunar rated procedural wings. These are just the normal space plane ones. But I do have a uh, uh, just to get some extra heat tolerance sometimes. If I'm doing a real space plane like a space shuttle, I uh, actually have added space plane uh, wings that have more heat tolerance and they are under a different name. They're the Pika X uh, space plane wings. They're originally meant for SpaceX's ITS and now BFR because those will require much more heat tolerance and Pika X is the heat shielding that SpaceX uses. But it's little things like that, you know, all over the place that make it hard for me to share craft files sometimes. And obviously sharing the entire game data folder is not doable because I don't have the rights to a lot of things. I could pitch down but that's uh, normally the way I'd control that is with elevator trim but we don't really have elevator trim here unlike in say X-Plane 11 where it's very easy to control the flight level of the aircraft and fine-tune it instead of using major joystick control. Here you basically have to use the major joystick control and so it's not great. Of course I could use the cruise flight controller but I'm so against flying with autopilot of any of that kind. You know this is fly-by-wire right now but that's not the same as autopilot. Um, yeah I believe that if I'm gonna fly a plane I ought to be flying the plane. Well, we are close to running out of fuel. I will try and pitch down very gently here. Not too sure how the occupants will feel about the forces on them. I'm also not sure that this is the legit max... Oh, max acceleration? Yeah, that's probably not reading right at all. It's tough to say. It's not like we've had passengers fly on a ramjet powered airliner before. It's probably a trick to make it quiet. <laughs> that might be a little bit of a problem. And people have mentioned about the SR-71 that, you know, we've got a thermal expansion problem. Hopefully modern material technology can handle that. Uh, as opposed to the material uh, technology during the time of the SR-71. I think we can deal with thermal expansion a little bit better with uh, new materials. Okay, we are just under Mach 5.5 right now. And still over 30 kilometers, though we'll be under it by the time the fuel runs out. And it looks like we'll get to 4,300 kilometers. Oh, it finished early. Okay, uh, 4,300 kilometers and let's make sure we're just aiming a little bit above prograde right now as we glide down and we'll see how far we get so currently maintaining an angle of attack of 3.4 3.5 degrees could probably go to 3. Point. we could i mean there's no telling exactly what's optimal right now could be a little bit higher but i don't want to like throw it off or anything we are still going at fairly high velocity, still above Mach 4. Also, uh, pitching up is not that great as far as the speed bleed off. So, the less we pitch up, the better as far as the drag is concerned. So, that's why I'm being very moderate about that. Uh, right now, we're uh, getting below Mach 3. We've covered an additional 220 kilometers during the glide so far still at 25 kilometers altitude so that's five kilometers down 220 kilometers in distance but it's not a proper glide it does that's not how you calculate the glide because we've lost velocity as well 
Normally the glide ratio is uh, calculated if you're maintaining the same velocity, but that wasn't really feasible anyway. We're now at 20 kilometers, Mach 1.7, and we've covered an additional 340 kilometers. I mean, technically, if we just had reserved a little bit of fuel for the J58 engine, gliding for a bit would not be a bad way to cover some extra ground. It's not technically a problem. The amount of benefit we get gliding down from 30 kilometers to 20 kilometers is much bigger than what we get from 20 kilometers on down after that because we're losing velocity, there's more density, more drag, and but that's what we want basically because we'll be turning the J58 on at 20 kilometers and proceeding from that because it's not going to be as efficient down here anyway. Uh, we've covered about 400 additional kilometers. We are now below the speed of sound and still descending. Well, we can safely assume that whatever FAR calculates down here for estimated range, it does not calculate us just gliding down like this. Or just the benefit of our lift and velocity. It knows our lift and velocity, but it's not calculating that into its range. Down here and at low speeds, our lift to drag ratio is much nicer, but we're going so slow that we're not covering as much ground, so it doesn't really do us any good anyway. I suppose we're going to experience how bad or good this is on a splashdown. Well, we have covered 462 kilometers since we ran out of fuel. Still losing velocity as we go down, though. So this is not much of a glider. It has to keep a fairly high angle of attack to... Uh, yeah, whoa. Okay, well, I I'll call that a little bit too glitchy to be reasonable, because something got accelerated to 4,900 meters per second. So, uh, we'll, we'll just pass on that particular splashdown test. That wasn't really the point. The, the point is, we got... Uh, Close to 4,800 kilometers in range, 4,300 powered, and we can continue on with this, I think. Uh, there are tweaks we can make. There is room for more fuel if we want to do that, though, yeah, I'll have to recalculate how much the cost of fuel per passenger is right now. It should be less, I mean, we're carrying less of a fuel load, I believe, but yeah. Anyway, this is where I'm at and uh, the effort continues on. I've already mentioned quite a few things that uh, could be done to improve the performance here, and I'll try that in subsequent episodes. So, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.